Well, welcome to our second session. And this time we're going to be exploring change design. So at the end of this session, you should have a better understanding of the different paradigms in educational theory. Some of the approaches to researching using socio-ecological modeling, in particular related to educational technology research, and have a better understanding of the application of systemic design in researching educational technologies, these various approaches that we're exploring. So let's get into things. Change design. So essentially, change in education can be difficult. And at most, it is a gradual process because education by its very nature is quite conservative. We're going to see some of the reasons for that as we explore some of the underlying theories around education and learning, particularly in um, K-12 schools. But there are various ways that we can understand change, how we can promote and guide changes in educational organizations. And a large part of this course is around understanding that, particularly in relation to educational technologies, so that we can affect change. And of course, we want to try to make that change not only possible, but also desirable because sometimes we can affect change in a bad way or inhibit change to make it even harder to have further changes occur. So in tutorial this week, there's going to be a range of readings and video clips for you to explore and to come prepared to discuss. But one thing, well, the first thing we're going to be discussing is the differences between progressive and conservative education. Now, there are a couple of readings for you to explore this in some more detail. Uh, the first of these is traditional and progressive schools, identifying the two models of educational practice. And in particular, they give a nice um, comparison summary of the two approaches and their strengths and weaknesses in terms of their differences. Then I want you to have a look at a reading called The Science of Learning, which starts exploring a new area of change in education around cognition and our better understanding of how the brain works. Now, this understanding wasn't necessarily available when at, in the 50s and 40s when the debate around progressive and conservative education was sort of raging, still raging, but um, at that stage, they didn't have a good understanding of some of the technical aspects of how the brain works in terms of neurons and all those sort of elements. And so there's been some additional concepts that need to be introduced if we're going to be exploring the differences between different educational processes. And now we're going to look at one of the seminal works around these discussions. This was done by John Dewey, who was an educational psychologist or psychologist that dabbled in education. Um, and he saw this debate in terms of extreme opposites and how naturally as human beings, we tend to explore the opposites on a spectrum where in reality, we eventually have to come to some form of compromise um, because you can never really take a purely opposite perspective or extreme perspective um, when there are two sort of competing perspectives that need to be considered. Um, and in terms of education, he saw education as, well, the two main ideas was education as development from within, um, how an individual develops in terms of their learning and their capacity, or, or formation from without, where external bodies, namely educational systems and teachers, um, form the individual, um, and that they are responsible primarily for how someone learns. So there's these two extreme perspectives. Um, and particularly in the perspective around formation, we have a natural inclination then to uh, impose our will upon students. Of course, by the nature of that philosophy, we are forming them. We are changing them to what we desire them to be. And the underlying assumption is that they are not perfect and we have to perfect them. Um, so these two perspectives under, underpin 
the traditional versus progressive education debate. Um, and the debate's been going on for well, 60, 70 years now and still is occurring. Um, we can see elements of it in the phonics versus whole language debate currently occurring in Australia um, and a range of other different perspectives as we're going to explore um, direct instruction versus uh, inquiry-based learning. These are all um, elements of this same debate that hasn't yet to be resolved in education. Okay, so essentially, from a traditional perspective, the subject matter of education consists of bodies of information and skills that have been worked out in the past, and it's the business of schools and educators to transmit them to the new generation. Um, so there are various standards of conduct and moral perspectives that we need to train students in so that they develop habits of action in conformity with these rules and standards, the expectations of society, replicating what society expects in each new generation. Um, in terms of education organisations and how schools are organised, um, it's very much in relation to the pupils with one another and to the teachers. Um, but this is quite different to how we organise other structures. Um, at home, for example, there's no, well, there's normally not such a strict hierarchy. There are parents and children and siblings, and grandparents, and a family relationship and uncles and aunts and uh, friends of the family. And everyone contributes but in schools, we take generally a very different type of structure. It's quite an authoritative structure. So we need to think of these in terms of the rules of order. Schools are set in place to establish these rules and they have a certain pattern of organization that is quite different to what we would see in a family organization. So there are three characteristics uh, around this perspective. One is that the main purpose or objective is to prepare the young for future responsibilities and for success in life. And that is done by the acquisition of um, organized sets of knowledge and specific skills that students need to develop so that they will be successful. And instruction is around achieving that. Um, now, since the subject matter is based on the past, um, what was done in the past is to be handed down to the, to the future generation. Um, it's very much a process of docility and receptivity and obedience. Students are there to learn about the past so that they can do what was done in the past into the future. And books, particularly textbooks, are the chief representatives of this law and wisdom of the past. And teachers' role is to connect students with that previous body of knowledge. Um, and they're then, then the agents by which that knowledge is, and skills are communicated and the rules of conduct are enforced. So that's the traditional perspective. And Jiru is very much around challenging that perspective in that there may be other ways of organizing education um, particularly as there was increasing discontent with the rigidity of such a perspective on, of, on learning so in essence the traditional um, scheme of way of teaching was the imposition from above and from outside so it wasn't the students that were in involved in it. It was the teachers and the educational organization imposing what society needed the students to conform to in order to prepare them for their place in society. Okay. And it was very much focused on the adults. The adults had the knowledge and wisdom and they were to impart it to the students. But they did it from an adult perspective, naturally. Um, but it was a very different perspective to children. 
children were learning through play and through activity-based processes that were very different to the academic rigor and strict discipline that was required by adults in how education was framed. So it was very foreign to young children. So they didn't have the skills to engage with that. When they were playing at home with their friends and their family, um, they didn't learn the rigors of scholarship that was now going to be imposed upon them. And so they had to learn that and it had to be imposed and override their natural tendencies towards play-based learning. So this didn't recognize the abilities of, of the young to learn. People have been learning long before schools came, were invented. Um, there are ways of learning that are separate to the traditional educational model. And throughout human history, that has been quite successful. So the current system or the traditional system really didn't allow students to have any involvement in the process. Um, learning was the acquisition of knowledge incorporated in books and in the heads of their elders. And it was essentially static. The knowledge generally didn't change. Um, and it was taught as a finished product. But that was quite divorced again from reality. In reality, knowledge is changing all the time. Science is developing new ideas, geography changes, even history changes in our understanding and interpretation of history. Um, the whole new process of re-looking at the past and how some of the revered heroes of the past are now being looked at in quite different light, given their perspectives on slavery and on various other issues. Um, so even our understanding of historical facts has been undergoing change. But the traditional model of education didn't really accommodate that. It was about imparting authoritative knowledge to students so that they could then be replicated into the future. But in today's society, as change is now accelerating and we're seeing what used to take decades to change happening in years and in potentially to be happening in months into the future, we need our children in order to cope with society and to cope with the rapid changes occurring in society to be much more adaptable and not rigorously um, accepting of the wisdom of the past, because that has to be able to be challenged and changed. So we then have the perspective of progressive education. Now, while traditional education was very much around imposition from above, progressive education focused on the expression and cultivation of individuality. While traditional education was focused on external discipline, progressive education was focused on free activity and children being able to express themselves actively and um, in their own active ways. From learning from text and teachers to learning through experiences. From the acquisition of isolated skills and techniques by drill to the acquisition, the acquisition of them as a means of attaining ends which make their direct appeal much more engaging. So learning about things in context, learning about things that they're interested in, um, rather than just learning what was to be taught by adults. Um, while traditional education focused more on preparation for more or less remote future, progressive education was making the most of opportunities in the students' current lives, what they were doing now, how they might make dinner for their family, how they might make an object, um, a, a billy cart or do a, make a website and it's around encompassing what the students are interested in and are actively engaged with as part of their learning rather than something more abstractly. And generally traditional education was focused on static aims and materials that hadn't changed for generations towards progressive education focusing on um, 
a changing world and acceptance of those changes. So that's a snapshot of Dewey's perspective on the differences between traditional and progressive education. But that was established in 1938. So quite a while ago now. We've still been struggling with these differences and these differences are still pervading our education debates at the moment. So you need to have at least a reasonable understanding of these fundamental forces at play within education. So in the tutorial, we're going to discuss your views on what makes effective education. It doesn't need to be necessarily progressive. You may have a very traditionalist perspective on education, and that's fine. People do have these different perspectives. That's the debate that's currently still ongoing, and we need to engage with that debate. And also looking though at the purpose of education. What is the purpose of education? Has it changed? Is it going to change further? So there's a couple of other readings to assist you with this. Uh, the first is what makes great teaching? A review of the underpinning research around effective teaching. And the second is teachers. What makes teachers make a difference? What is the research evidence that they actually do? Um, and this helps frame some particular approaches to teaching and learning. So read through those, take notes and come prepared to discuss them in the tutorial. In Teams now, what I would like you to do is post the top five factors you believe are most important in effective education and briefly just support them with some sort of evidence or argument. So what are the five key things that you feel are most important in education and why? Okay. So now we're going to explore a tool to better understand the various stakeholders within an educational organization and the different perspectives that they have. We've just seen a couple of perspectives around traditional versus progressive education, but there's many other perspectives that different stakeholders can have. Now, when we talk about stakeholders, they can be quite different people, even and organizations and so forth. Um, a stakeholder might be yourself as a teacher or as a researcher, your students, and they may be broken into various groups. Um, there's different faculty groups, different subject groups, different year level groups, different sector groups. You've got private schools and you've got um, public schools. You've got international schools. There's a whole range of differences in that. So there's a whole range of differences where people have different perspectives on education. And then you've got the organizational structures, um, whether or not, whether you're a leader in a school um, or a principal or a regional director or the minister of education. Um, again, you'll have different perspectives. And then there are other um, stakeholders. Parents are stakeholders. Employers are stakeholders. The community is a stakeholder in education. So there's a whole range of different um, groups and people that are interested in what happens in education. And as you develop your um, transformation plan and your proposal for an educational intervention, you're going to need to unpack the various stakeholders that are going to be interested in this educational intervention. Um, because the primary reason that we unpack and uh, um, study them is so that we can work out whether or not they are going to be supportive or hinder any proposed um, change. If they're going to be supportive, how can we utilize that support to make the change more effective? If they're going to hinder, how can we either bring them around to a positive perspective or sideline them or in some way contain their um, adverse uh, influence so that it doesn't unduly impact upon the change that we want to see made. So we use a model called the social, social ecological model to better understand these various groupings. So they are put in multiple levels of influence, 
And we start with individual, then interpersonal, then organizational, then public policy. Um, there's a range of different terms that we're going to see that are used for these different levels. Um, and they have behaviors that both shape and are shaped by the social environment of the organization that we're studying. So the principles of social, eco of social ecological models are within the theory of, of research called social cognitive theory. That's around creating an environment that's conducive to, for change. Understanding the actors in the various organizations that are going to be involved in such change. We just went through the actors, another name for stakeholders. And better understanding them will enable us to shape the policies and strategies that can support change. So this is a general model of a social ecological system. At the, at the Innes uh, model, we have the individual. And we call this the micro system or the um, well, sometimes the microsystem incorporates also the, the individual, but at the smallest level, we have the ind individuals that are involved in the process. And they're going to have various um, uh, differentiating factors, their gender, their age, their health, um, how long before retirement? That actually can be a big one when we're trying to affect change. Um, and they will have certain characteristics that will either lend them towards supporting the change that you're wanting to introduce or to oppose it or to remain neutral. Um, and also sometimes indifference, another category, but they will have certain uh, perspectives on the change that you want to introduce. Then you have what's called the microsystems. So there'll be groups of friends and they may get together and whinge about changes and, or a group of friends that are working towards making change happen. Um, and this microsystem, when we're looking at different levels, might involve the school and all the various uh, groups within a school, or it might be a, the houses within a school, or the, the social groups within a school, uh, the classes, but they're, they're groups beyond the individual, but they're groups that have some sort of relationship to one another, some sort of interest, be they family groups or school-based groups or clubs. Um, then you have the, what's called the meso system. This is more the uh, structured groups. So it might be the, all the different types of schools, um, different organizational groups, like um, it might be professional associations. Um, but another grouping would be like all the maths teachers. So it's not just the maths teachers in that school, but maths teachers in general will have different perspectives on things. So introducing a new educational technology, let's say calculators, maths teachers in general will have a certain perspective on the introduction of calculators. Within a school, there'll also be a different perspective on the introduction of calculators. And then individuals will also have a different, potentially a different perspective on the introduction of calculators, often for different reasons. And it's understanding those reasons and how we can influence those um, different levels and different individuals to have them support the change is what social ecological modeling is about. Then at a higher level, we have the um, exosystem and the macrosystems. Um, exosystems are things such as um, policies and industries, um, like the education system as a whole how it has different perspectives on things. And then at the very highest level, the macro is more societal changes, how we would get society to... One thing at the moment is around screen time or use of mobile devices. These are societal perspectives around technologies uh, being applied in schools. And influencing that is obviously much harder, but it still needs to be considered because it can have a significant impact upon other layers within the um, socio-ecological model. Okay, so to help you understand that, there's a couple of little video clips that will make it a little bit easier. They don't explain it particularly well, but have a look at those. And then in the tutorial, we're going to discuss socio-ecological models in more detail. 
and the experiences you may have had with such organizations and how the influencing factors um, can occur within the organization. And then there's some readings for you to unpack socio-ecological modeling in more detail. The first is a study that was done around resilience and using socio-ecological modeling to understand better um, the different agencies and individuals and groups within a school related to building the resilience of students. And the other one is one of my research studies, which was looking at socio-ecological modeling, analyzing, um, uh, it was actually maths, maths educators in pre-service teacher education um, in their use of ICT, use of technology for teaching and learning. But it in particular goes through and unpacks the different um, layers and looks at the different influencing factors that those different layers have on various um, aspects being considered in the study. Okay, then there's some more examples for you to have a look at. These are just website examples that they show different explorations of the model. Um, so this one is based around a health study, but looking at individual, interpersonal, organizational, community and policy levels in what we call an onion diagram, which is these layers. Another model was looking at um, various individual, interpersonal, organizational, community and public policy issues. And then there was another one that sort of broke them into individual relationships, community and societal um, structures. So they just give you again different perspectives on how SEM is used in research. Um, now, in teams, again, I'd like you to try to think through in your learning for this course, um, see if you can consider how, what interesting factors there are in terms of individual, interpersonal, organizational and community. Um, so, for example, what factors influence you around your learning about educational technology? What factors might influence the other teammates in this course? in terms of as a group, how you might be being influenced by various um, factors. It may be towards getting better grades or things of that nature. Um, now, individually, you might have that as a factor as well, but then try to think more broadly in terms of as a, as a group of students. And try not to relate it then just to yourself, but as a generic group of students, what would students studying educational technologies be likely to be influenced by. Then think about it from an organizational perspective, in this case, the university. In terms of the university, in exploring how educational technologies can be taught about and improving the use of educational technologies in education, what might be some interesting factors that a university would be influenced by? And then we'd be looking at, at the community in terms of the wider, broader community in terms of providing support for education. So uh, providing fee support to um, support universities in providing these sorts of courses, um, seeing the benefits from these courses as graduates go out into society and utilize these skills in different ways. So think of it in terms of if we were going to change this course and say we we're going to teach about um, Oh, something we could teach about. Let's say we're going to teach about artificial intelligence more. Um, so that could be a significant change. What impact would that have on individuals studying the course? What would it have on students as a group studying the course? What would impact might it have on the community? What impact would it have on the university? So these are the things you start considering as you build an onion diagram looking at these various influencing factors. Now, when you've done the readings, it'll make a bit more sense and you'll be able to sort of unpack these and post that to Teams, do the diagram. There's a tool I provided a link to on the course website called Easy Draw, um, which will help you draw the onion diagrams. You can do it in almost any tool, you can do it in Word, um, but 
there's a tool if you want to use that. Uh, but post that to Teams and we can then use that to support our discussions in the tutorials. Okay, so all this of course is supporting your assessment um, in terms of your design-based research proposal. And part of that is going to be presenting a social ecological model for the educational organization that you're going to be exploring in relation to the educational technology that you're going to be introducing, the intervention. So your organization can be at any level. It could be an individual classroom. Um, it could be a group of teachers within the school. It could be the faculty, um, a cluster, cluster of schools, a department or sector, a state um, education system, or even a national education system. Um, now, in all those cases, you can still do the onion diagram and explore various influencing factors. Just um, if you're doing it at a national level, then those macro level influencing factors tend to be a little bit more important. But even then, if you're looking at uh, how countries relate to each other, there would still be ministers of education as individuals within each country that would have an influencing factor over the direction a country would have around, say, the introduction of a educational technology, say it was a laptop program for the entire country. Um, and then within that, there'd still be uh, various um, micro level groups and um, it might be different states that would have different perspectives. You might have rich states versus poor states. They would have different perspectives around the introduction of laptops. Uh, there'd be very different industry groups that would have different perspectives on that and so forth. But likewise, introducing laptops into a classroom you would have different students that would have individual um, abilities to purchase the laptops. Uh, there'd be different groups in your in your class. Um, you might have a group of students that love playing computer games, and they'll have a very different perspective to another group that might be very much into sports and wouldn't necessarily see as much advantage from using and having to have laptops being used in the class. And then you'd have other teachers at a macro or a meso level and how they might interact and um, if one class is using it and other classes aren't, how that's going to impact them or is, is it going to force all the, all the teachers have to use them? And then within the school and the parental bodies and there'd be a whole range of other stakeholders that will be interested in the introduction of the educational technology and need to be considered. And that's what we do with socio-ecological modelling. Okay, so as part of that, you're going to be providing a description uh, your description will be a, a structured using a social ecological model that identifies the key stakeholders in the organization and the expectations they would have from your proposed changes. Um, you'll also be doing an evaluation framework. Now, in terms of your overall course, in terms of all four assignments um, towards your transformation plan, you're going to be doing other elements of evaluation as we go into other other aspects of your transformation plan. At this stage, though, you do need to do an evaluation frame back, so framework on the intervention you're proposing, but it's based on the outcomes you expect from the study. So what are you expecting to achieve through um, your design-based research proposal and the study you're proposing? Um, that will have two elements. One will be the research outcomes, and the second will be the organizational outcomes. Now, the research outcomes should be framed in terms of contribution to educational theory. What is your design-based research going to teach us about um, educational processes in general, or the research process in general? So it's really coming from a perspective of what would researchers learn from reading your study? And then the other perspective is the organizational outcomes. Generally, these are focused on by the teacher involved in the um, collaborative study. And it relates very much then to the various stakeholders. So what would the students expect to see as a result of the study? What would the other teachers, what would the teacher involved and their peers expect to see? What might the principal expect to see? 
What might the education department expect to see? What might parents expect to see? And they'll all have slightly different perspectives on what would be an important outcome from your research study. So that's how you frame your evaluation in terms of being able to measure um, the research outcomes and the organizational outcomes. So you don't need to go into a huge amount of detail, but that gives you a structure for setting out what you're going to evaluate. Of course, remember, evaluation is planned at the start of a process so that you can then, at the end of the process, measure it and see whether or not it has been achieved. But you need to consider it at the beginning, otherwise you don't collect the data that's needed to be able to then do that measurement at the end. Okay, so your design-based research proposal um, doesn't need to go beyond looking at those two factors, um, research outcomes and organizational outcomes. But over time, you're going to develop the vision, aim, and policies and transformation plan, and that will include various other aspects of evaluation. Okay, so in the tutorial, come prepared to discuss what elements of your proposed intervention you could measure and evaluate. And we'll discuss that and unpack that and make that a little clearer for you in the tutorial session. So that's it for this week. And I look forward to seeing you all in the tutorial.